Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to have a chance to do a visit with you folks again, and I think you're aware with the COVID pandemic and so forth that we're, we thought it would be would be best at this time, anyhow, just to go ahead and do the programs by, by uh, email. And uh, of course, an advantage, you can watch them at your convenience and uh, you can skip through them at your convenience. And if you decide you don't like the program, of course, you, you don't have to watch it. So, so, so uh, my program for today is the, the last three months of the, of the Civil War, or I prefer using the term, the war between the states, which was, a, I just cannot say how horrible that the war was. And, and I'm trying to dwell more on the human aspect of, of this war. So I think you'll follow that as, as we go along. Well, and I, I'll be going chronologically. And let me say now, if I refer to somebody strictly by their last name, that does not by any means mean any disrespect to that person. That's, in fact, at that time, I think it was very common just to call people by their last names. And, and you may be aware that, that Mr. Lincoln himself preferred just being called Lincoln rather than Abe or Abraham. And his, his wife, Mary, even just referred to him as Mr. Lincoln. So. So, uh, well, we're starting on February 23rd of 1865, and this is from the diary of General Ruther B. Hayes, uh, from Fremont that you may be familiar with. And by the way, one of our wonderful Ohio generals that I will be pointing out from time to time. And uh, General Hayes is in, in Cumberland, Maryland, as he, as he wrote this in his diary. You need not be surprised to hear that the enemy are across the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad at any time. I have great faith in my troops, my vigilance, and my luck, but I shall be much mistaken if the rebels don't overwhelm a number of our posts during the next six weeks or two months. Nothing but their extreme weakness will prevent it. How gloriously things are moving. Columbia, Charleston, South, or Fort Sumter, Lee must act speedily. I should think he would gather up all the scattered forces and attack either Grant or Sherman before Sherman gets within supporting distances of Grant. But it is all guess. The next two months will be more and more interesting with the hopes, at least, in our favor largely. If Lee evacuates Richmond and pulls towards Lynchburg or Danville, it will merely prolong the struggle. The evacuation of Richmond is a confession of defeat. February 24th, the next day, this is from a soldier's diary, David Lane, and I'm sorry, I don't know more about, about David Lane. More glorious news from the South, Wilmington is ours. Another salute was fired this afternoon, to which the rebels feebly responded. It is impossible to describe the effect of these frequent successes upon our troops. The utmost enthusiasm prevails. The opposite effect is plainly visible across the line. It makes itself apparent by frequent desertions. Another captain with his entire company, 60 men, came through the lines of the 1st Division last night, the second instance of the kind this week. Five men with equipment on came to division headquarters today. They were on picket and deserted their post in broad daylight. An early movement of the rebels is confidently expected. Our men are ready with knapsacks packed to move at the tap of a drum. It is only a precautionary measure and means be ready to fight or to pursue. To attack would be madness on their part. To retreat an act of folly, to remain as they are much longer it is impossible. So at least it seems to me old Bobby may think differently. Deserters say he has given out word he will astonish the world on the fourth day of March. Well, on this same day, February 24th, was a letter from the Brevet Major General George Custer from the headquarters of the 3rd Cavalry Division to Ohio Governor Brow. And General Custer is another of our Ohio generals. As Lieutenant Colonel Nettleton of the 2nd Ohio Cavalry is about to proceed to his home in Ohio with the intention of procuring as many men as possible to fill his regiment, I desire to urge upon you the propriety of rendering Colonel Nettleton all possible facilities for accomplishing this end. 
The Second Ohio has been under my command for a considerable period, during which time they have been repeatedly engaged with the enemy. Upon all such occasions, their conduct has been most gallant and deserving. I have known this regiment to hold positions against vastly superior forces of the enemy under circumstances which most regiments would have considered as warranting a retreat. And I take pleasure in assuring you that in my entire division, numbering 12 regiments from different states, I have none in which I repose greater confidence than in the 2nd Ohio. For these reasons, I feel assured that the interest of the service would be greatly promoted by filling the regiment to the maximum number. You cannot find among the many gallant sons of Ohio a more gallant or deserving officer than Lieutenant Colonel Nettleton. This signed very respectfully, G.A. Custer, Breveted Major General. And this is a letter to uh, Colonel Nettleton, uh, written by by uh, by uh, Colonel Siebert, and and Nettleton, by the way, is commanding the Second Ohio Cavalry. The general has directed me to express to you his great and entire satisfaction with the manner in which the pickets from your regiment were performing their duties today while he was inspecting the line. Not a man failed to understand and execute the orders issued from these at superior headquarters. Not a man, but who did credit to himself and his regiment. The general is much gratified to see that your men on the picket line are anxious, like true soldiers, to keep up the excellent reputation uh, your regiment has won on the battlefield. Very respectfully yours, uh, uh, Siebert A.A. General. Well, this, this incident, which caused forth the above letter, occurred the day before, and while Sheridan's army was in winter quarters at Winchester, Virginia, uh, General Custer, with his staff and escort, galloping out the Romney Pike, came suddenly upon the sentinel at the picket post, who ordered halt and demanded the countersign. An attempt by the general to awe the sentinel, who was told that certainly he knew very well who he was, made no difference, and the general proceeding to ride forward was again abruptly stopped before the sentinel's raised gun and the declaration that he would shoot anyone attempting to pass without first giving the countersign. Thereupon the general dismounted, advanced, gave the countersign, and was permitted to pass. And as I read before, General Custer was very impressed with that sentinel, that uh, he, he did his duty. And those of us that were in the military, and I, I recall standing guard duty at nighttime, we were given those orders that no one was to pass uh, without the countersign. Well, we're now at March the 2nd. This is from the diary of General Hayes, uh, in, still in Cumberland, Maryland. It is a rainy, dismal day. General Hancock is in charge of this department. General Sheridan has collected all of his cavalry and is on a big raid to cut and slash the railroads west of Richmond or to capture Gordonsville or something of the sort. I doubt whether we see any more battles. I shall consider myself discharged as soon as my four years are up and Richmond taken. I shall be surprised if the latter does not occur first. Great preparations are making for the inauguration. If nothing disastrous happens to our armies, it will be the greatest thing of the sort that ever has been witnessed in the country. And as I mentioned, General Hayes, an Ohio general, and General Sheridan, an Ohio general from Somerset, Ohio. Well, March the 2nd, same day, uh, From this is from the diary of Lumen Harris Tenney of the U.S. Cavalry. It commenced to rain early. Our division massed just before the reaching our old camp at Waynesboro at 3 o'clock p.m. The Virginia Brigade formed mounted. We formed dismounted, went out where we could see the rebel lying on a hill and in the woods running almost around the second Ohio in advance as skirmishers. Forward was given and the second went forward until it carried the woods on the hill driving the Johnnies pell-mell. I was mounted and went in on the music and went on the muscle when the rebels gave way, took a great many prisoners myself, captured 1,300 prisoners, 10 guns, 
150 wagons and 10 stands of colors. Events charged through the gap and burned a heavy amount of supplies at Greenville. General Early barely escaped capture. It is a wonder to me how the boys stood it so well. General Custer gave us great credit. Camp just through the gap, it is raining. March the 3rd, with President Lincoln's signature, federal law established the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands, or just Freedmen's Bureau for short. It was created to help both African Americans and Southern whites who had been displaced or impoverished by the war. It distributed food and clothing, provided medical care, oversaw a school system of former slaves, helped to reunite lost family members and more. The Freedmen's Bureau was established for one year, but it quickly became clear that its work would be more difficult than had initially been thought due to the establishment in the South of the Black Codes that placed stringent restrictions on African Americans' freedom and forced them to work for low wages. Their purpose and effect was to main white supremacy. When in 1866, Congress renewed the charter for the Bureau, President Andrew Johnson vetoed it and the Congress failed to override his veto. And I shouldn't say this, I probably, but I, you're aware that uh, Andrew Johnson was replaced uh, President Lincoln after Lincoln's assassination. And I have heard it said there could not have been a worse choice for vice president than Andrew Johnson. And I better leave that go with that. So. Well, we're at March the 4th. Artilleryman Jenkins Lloyd Jones at Chattanooga. Uh, heavy thunder and lightning last night with the rain pouring down while I was walking my muddy beat. Today it cleared up but a little. This is the day on which Abraham Lincoln is to be inaugurated president for the second time. After four years of tempestuous sailing, mid terrible breakers, he has carried the good old ship of, of state throughout. May his second voyage know more sunshine and be as successful as before. News is meager. Rumors of the evacuation of Richmond and Petersburg follow up the confirmation of the fall of the rebellious Charleston. Well, March the 4th, Lincoln delivered a second inaugural address on the east steps of the Capitol building. Lincoln gave the speech beneath gray skies outside the United States Capitol. But as the president spoke, the sun burst through the woods. The symbolism was not lost on the new chief justice by the Supreme Court, Salmon P. Chase, who was Lincoln's one-time rival. And Chase called it an auspicious omen of the dispersion of the clouds of war. And Lincoln himself admitted, it made my heart jump. Newspaper reporter Noah Brooks observed, but chiefly memorable in the mind of those who saw that second inauguration must still remain the tall, pathetic, melancholy figure of the man who then inducted into office in the midst of the glad acclaim of thousands of people and illumined by the deceptive brilliance of a March sunburst was already standing in the shadow of death. Days after his inaugural address, President Lincoln wrote to New York news newspaper publisher and Republican politician Thurlow Weed that he believed the speech would wear as well as perhaps better than anything I have produced. But I believe it is not immediately popular. Men are not flattered by being shown that there has been a difference of purpose between the Almighty and them. This last comment presumably refers to the following passage. Both parties, north and south, read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance in, bring, in bringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered, that of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses, which in the providence of God must needs come, but which having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove 
and that he gives to both north and south this terrible war as a woe due to those by whom the offense came. Shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Finally, do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled up by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And President Lincoln's closing sentence, with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Well, one newspaper of the day thought the concluding sentiments of Lincoln's second inaugural address with malice towards none, etc., deserved to be printed in gold. Well, Harriet Beecher Stowe, one winter evening, had asked if the president did not feel a great relief over the prospect of the war soon coming to a close, and he answered in a sad way, No, Mrs. Stowe, I shall never live to see peace. This war is killing me. And uh, I trust you are all familiar with Harriet Beecher Stowe, who uh, uh, lived in Cincinnati, Ohio, and it was... Mrs. Stowe that wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, and and uh, which was 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 fiction, but it was very realistic. And and uh, well, I did read it myself, and I suggest you not read Uncle Tom's Cabin before you go to bed. You you are sure to have dreams that night. Well, we're on March the fifth. This is General Hayes' diary at Cumberland, Maryland. General Sheridan has got together all the four-footed beasts of this region and mounted his last trooper. They are gone to try to destroy railroads and stores, if possible, all the way to Lynchburg. We are thinking of nothing else just now. The only danger is the mud and the high waters from the rains and the melting snows. He is reported to have had a good little success at Woodstock, taking four guns and 400 prisoners. A few weeks will probably produce great changes in the situation. Even a considerable disaster to our arms now will hardly enable the rebels to hold Richmond much longer. Well, on the same day from an artillery men's diary, March the 5th, Jenkins Lloyd, the, the artillery made us Jenkins Lloyd Jones at Chattanooga. He writes, a most beautiful day, too good to lay in camp, attend the church, join the Bible class in the chapel of the Christian Commission, where we had a spirited discussion as to whether we are ever justifiable in disobeying the divine law in order to conform with the law of the land. Most took the old abolitionist view of it. After class listened to a good sermon, the text was, What is Man? by one of the agents, I met Lieutenant Silsby, very sociably inclined. I uh, returned to camp to enjoy a soldier's dinner. I did write to John and I read a sermon of H.W. Beecher. And Mr. Beecher, Reverend Beecher, was a brother of, of, uh, of uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Well, also March the 5th, Captain Charles Wright. Uh, I'm sorry, Charles Wright Wills, his diary, and he is at Shiraw, South Carolina. We will get out of South Carolina tomorrow. I have not been in a house in the state occupied by a citizen. Everything in Shiraw of any value to the enemy, including cotton and business houses, is going up in smoke. General Wood says we have 120 miles yet to make. You may give the credit of Wilmington, Charleston, and Georgetown to whom you please. We know General Sherman deserves it. 
Our foragers all went across the river this morning and got plenty of flour, meal, and, uh, and meat. They were out 11 miles and saw a few rebels. The rebels left seven cannon on the other side of the river and burned a very large amount of, of commissary and ordnance stores. And I trust you are well aware of General Sherman from Lancaster, Ohio, one more of our wonderful Ohio generals. Well, March the 6th, two days after the inauguration, the New York Times reported that several African Americans had attended the reception for all callers after the, the ceremony. People were allowed to come and shake the president's hand. A band played, and the president and some of the other national officials presided. Frederick Douglass, having heard the second inaugural address, determined that he would attend the reception. As they approached the White House, police stopped them. Douglas insisted on going in and declared that if Lincoln knew he was outside, he would permit blacks to enter. The officers disagreed, and Douglas had to run past them into the building itself. Two more policemen stopped him and did their best to get Douglas out of there. Seeing a friend, Douglas asked him to tell Lincoln what was happening. Within half a minute, the black leader was ushered into the crowded East Room. Lincoln spotted him coming and in a loud voice announced, here comes my friend Douglas. He reached out and took his friend's hand and asked what he had thought of the inaugural speech. And Lincoln said, there is no man's opinion I value more than yours. What did you think of it? Uh, Mr. Douglas protested that there were thousands waiting to shake Lincoln's hand, but Lincoln wanted the process to stop for a moment. And Lincoln again asked for his opinion as the crowd watched, and Douglas said, it was a sacred effort. I'm glad you liked it, Lincoln replied, and the handshaking ceremony was allowed to proceed. And you might be aware Frederick Douglass was the first uh, gentleman of African descent that was invited into the White House to speak with President Lincoln. And they, they became very good friends. And, and, and President Lincoln had tremendous respect for Frederick Douglass. And of course, Frederick Douglass was born a slave and managed to escape. Okay, we're now, we're still at March the 6th, uh, two days after the inauguration. This is from Downing Civil War Diary. That he has some abbreviated sentences here. I'll just read it as he wrote it. Pleasant weather. We started at 9 a.m., marched eight miles, and went into bivouac near Bennisville. We are marching through a fine country and have plenty of forage. There are no rebels in front of us at present. We are nearing the state line now between South Carolina and North Carolina, and our army has certainly made a wide path of desolation through the state. In our march through South Carolina, every man seemed to think that he had a free hand to burn any kind of property he could put the torch to. South Carolina paid the dearest penalty of any state in the Confederacy, considering the short time the Union Army was in the state, and as well that she should, for if South Carolina had not been so persistent in going to war, there would have been no war for years to come. And you are probably familiar with South Carolina that was the first state to leave the Union. March the 7th, this is from Jenkin Lloyd Jones' diary, an artilleryman at Chattanooga. A great cheerless day and my feelings were very much the same. Somehow or other, a feeling of sadness and seriousness settled upon me that in spite of all my efforts I could not shake, I am very severely troubled with such and feel as though I ought not to, but I suppose the great cause is a non-arrival of mail, none having come in since Friday. And I trust you folks all can imagine, if you've not experienced yourself, uh, the great importance of receiving mail, letters from home especially. Well, Bridges, back to uh, Mr. Jones' diary, Bridges swept off north of Stevenson by the flood, which is making sad work here also. The Tennessee has risen above its high and rocky banks and throws its watery arm clear around Chattanooga, leaving us on an island. Inhabitants on the banks have to flee to the hills for safety. 
where a week ago we could see four extensive sawmills erected and used by the government, throwing out thousands of feet of lumber and shingles per day, is now one watery waste, a turbid torrent rolling with the relentless fury to form with the mighty father of waters. Work is plenty in camp. We placed the ground for stables this afternoon, etc. About the same date, March the 7th, this is a letter from Charles Francis Adams to his father. What do you think of the inaugural? By the way, this letter was just three days after the inaugural. That real, and here's what Mr. Adams wrote it to his father. That real splitting lawyer is one of the wonders of the day. Once at Gettysburg, and now again on a great occasion, he has shown a capacity for rising to the demands of the hour, which we should not expect from orators or men of the schools. This inaugural strikes me in its grand simplicity and directness, as being for all time the historical keynote of this war. In it, a people seem to speak in the sublimely simple utterance of, of broader times, what will Europe think of this utterance of the rude ruler, of whom they have nourished so lofty a contempt? Not a prince or minister in all of Europe could have risen to such an equality with the occasion. Well, this is from a rebel war clerk's diary regarding President Lincoln's inaugural message. Again, a rebel clerk. And uh, he refers it, to the inaugural message or homily or sermon has been received. It is filled with text from the Bible. He says, both sides pray to the same God for aid, one upholding and the other destroying African slavery. If slavery be an offense and woe shall fall upon those by whom offenses come, perhaps not only all the slaves will be lost, but all the accumulated products of their labor be swept away. In short, he quotes scripture for the deed quite as fluently as our, as our president. Of course, Jefferson Davis is who he's referring to. And back to the diary. And since both presidents resort to religious justification, can maybe fear the war is about to assume a more sanguinary aspect and a more cruel nature than ever before. God help us. The history of man, even in the Bible, is but a series of bloody wars. It must be thus to make us appreciate the blessings of peace and to bow in humble adoration of the great father of all. The Garden of Eden could not yield contentment to man, nor heaven satisfy all the angels. Now, still March the 8th. This is Colonel Lyon's letters to Huntsville, Alabama, or he's at Huntsville, Alabama. This is what Colonel Lyons wrote. We are in fine spirits today, for we have just heard that Sheridan has cleaned out General Early in the Shenandoah Valley, capturing him and nearly his whole army. We all believe this and rejoice, for it is by such blows as these, and these only, that this war will be ended. I attended a review of the Fourth Corps yesterday. There were six or 7,000 troops in line, and they made a fine appearance. Well, March the 10th, and, and uh, Doubting Civil War Diary started on our march again at 7 o'clock this morning and made 12 miles today. It is still raining, and the creeks and swamps are all overflowing. There was no show of keeping our clothing dry, for besides the rain, we had to wade some 13 creeks and sloughs, some of them waist deep. This is a most God-forsaken stretch of country, and there is only now and then a small farm I can't understand how anybody could live here. In fact, the citizens all have left to their homes. March the 11th, this is from Captain Charles Will's diary. He is at Davis Bridge, Rock Fish Creek, 10 miles today, full seven, of which had to be corduroyed, the worst road I ever saw. The 17th Corps occupied Fayetteville today, the foragers took the place. It is large as, as large as Columbia and has a large arsenal. Heard of two or three men being captured by the rebels yesterday and a couple today. 
They also made a little dash on our rear today on the third division without accomplishing anything. I do wish you could see the crowd of Negroes following us. Some say 2,000 of those folks with our division. I think fully 1,000 anyhow. And I feel I need to say, I hope nobody's offended by, by my using the word Negroes. That's a very common term back at that time. So. And by the way, I, I trust you're familiar with the corduroy roads when they would reach uh, such bad mud they couldn't get through, they would fell the trees and, and uh, lay the trunks of the trees side by side and cross over the element. And can you imagine uh, how, how, how hard it would be to, to walk? And I cannot, well, I cannot imagine horses walking on that. And, and especially the wagons bump, bump, bump over those logs as they're going down the, the, uh, the, the street. I, there's just so many things I cannot begin to imagine at this time. Well, March the 11th went forth the president's proclamation that any and all deserters, wherever they may be, and no matter what had happened to carry their feet away from the army on return to their regiments or companies shall be pardoned. March the 12th, this is a diary of a Southern refugee by the name of Judith White McGuire. A deep gloom has just been thrown over the city by the untimely death of one of his own heroic sons, General John uh, Pegram fell while nobly leading his brigade against the enemy in the neighborhood of Petersburg. But two weeks before, he had been married in St. Paul's Church in the presence of a crowd of relatives and friends to the celebrated uh, Miss H.C. of Baltimore. All was bright and beautiful. Happiness beamed from every eye. Again, has St. Paul's, his own beloved church, been open to receive the soldier and his bride? The soldier confined for a hero's, the, the soldier coffined for a hero's grave. The other, his wife, pale and trembling, though still by his side in her widow's garb. And, and uh, by the way, this photo obviously is from a, a more modern group of reenactors at a at a wedding, and I, I could not find a, a photo of a of a Civil War wedding that I thought was of a, of the rebels that what I thought was uh, was really appropriate. So, okay, March the thirteenth, as early as January of eighteen sixty four, Confederate Major General Patrick Cleburne had proposed that freed slaves be used as soldiers, but the notion had been summarily rejected by President Davis. By the fall of 1864, however, the South situation was dire, and some felt that desperate times called for desperate measures. Even in January of 1865, there were holdouts. Howell Cobb of Georgia, who was a former Speaker of the United States House of Representatives and Secretary of the Treasury under President Buchanan, and one of the founders of the Confederacy, opposed a measure writing to President Davis if slaves will make good soldiers, our whole theory of slavery is wrong. Nevertheless, on March the 13th, the Confederate Congress passed and President Davis signed a law permitting slaves to serve as soldiers. The military order putting the law into effect was issued March the 23rd, but only a few African Americans were enlisted and the war ended before they saw combat. Well, March 14th, Downing Civil War Diary, I went out early this morning with the foraging party of our division in search of feed for the horses and mules. We came to a rich plantation about four miles out with corn cribs well filled. And in a short time, we had the wagons loaded. Some of us have been put to loading the wagons while others went to get the chickens and other things. After the boys had caught and loaded all the chickens and upset fully a hundred beehives, they called out, the rebels are coming. We had just finished loading the wagons, but that call was enough to frighten the teamsters and they put the whip to the mules, starting off at a dead run. The road ran through a heavy timber, but it was wide and perfectly level, and they galloped the teams the whole way back to the bivouac it was every fellow for himself, and I never ran faster in my life. A commissioner from Cornell College uh, in Mount Vernon, Iowa, 
uh, was in camp today for the purpose of raising money to educate the orphan children of soldiers and sailors. And our company raised $229, which was a lot of, lot of money at that time. By the way, it's a, such a sad story that even our Union soldiers uh, had, to, had to go to robbing folks in the South, uh, especially the beautiful plantations as you see pictured here. And, and uh, what, a, what a horrible thing, but it that's, that's, seemed like the only way that they were going to get the Southern folks to surrender. So. This is March the 14th from General Hayes. General Sheridan is tearing up railroads, burning bridges, and destroying the James River Canal very successfully. He goes near Lynchburg, Gordonsville, and beyond Staunton. I hope he will, in spite of high water, get over the James River and cut the Danville Railroad and join General Grant. Well, March the 18th, the Confederate Congress, Congress adjourned its last session today. March 19th, again a rebel war, clerk's diary, I, again a rebel war diary. Uh, thousands of non-combatants and families falling weakly within the power of Sherman's army have succumbed to circumstances and perforce submitted. I suppose most of those remaining in Savannah, Charleston, Wilmington, etc., have taken the oath of allegiance to the United States and I hear of no censures upon them for doing so, whether they will be permitted long to enjoy their property, not their slaves, of course, will depend upon the policy adopted at Washington. If it be confiscated, the war will certainly continue for years, even under the direction of President Davis, who was now quite unpopular. If a contrary course be pursued, the struggle may be more speedily terminated, perhaps after the great uh, the next great battle, Mrs. Davis has become unpopular with the ladies belonging to the old families. Her father, Mr. Howell, is said to be of low origin, and this is quite enough to disgust the ladies of high birth, in quotation mark, but yet occupying less exalted positions. March the 21st, General Hayes' letter to his wife, and the generals at Camp Hastings, you would have boiled over with enjoyment if you had been here today. General Crook came out to my quarters, both bands were out, and all the men. And I feel I need to mention it at this time myself here how important that the Civil War bands uh, were to the, the folks, to a great morale, a spirit booster to the soldiers, and, and uh, well, you might be, we're, we're so in hopes that we can have our, our uh, uh, Civil War History Day here at the Worcester Library uh, here. This, that'll be, I believe, the May the 7th, the second Saturday uh, uh, of, of May. And uh, if, you, if you've been here before, you'll recall that the, the band plays original Civil War instruments, which is, which is phenomenal, and we're so in hopes that we could arrange for for that. That, that, that let's 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 say that the COVID will allow us to arrange uh, for that. So we had about uh, back to the diary, or back to his letter to his wife uh, by General Hayes. We had about forty rousing cheers, a speech from Chaplain Collier, a good talk from the general, a little one from me, and lots of fun. It is four weeks today since the capture. We are having the finest possible time. The 23rd is not camped with me now. It is two and a half miles off and the prettiest camp they ever had, the other side of town. But the brigade is a unit now. The mountain scenery is glorious. The men happy and well behaved. Chaplain Little and his wife get up something good at the log chapel every day. March the 23rd from Downing Civil War Diary. An order from General Sherman was read this morning stating that the campaign was over and that we should now prepare to take a short rest. This battle proved to be our last and is known as the Battle of Bentonville. We took part later in the surrender of Johnston's army at Raleigh, North Carolina, but there was no battle then or before the surrender, only just a little skirmishing. 
We left the rifle pits at seven o'clock, March 15 miles, and bivouacked within five miles of Goldsboro. Our army is concentrating there, and we are to get supplies, rest up, and prepare for another campaign. Well, the same day, to March the 23rd, Lincoln had been sick part of the time so far in March and was besieged by office seekers the rest of the time. When General Grant invited Lincoln to come to City Point, Virginia, to visit at his headquarters to get away from Washington City, Lincoln jumped at the chance. And he took along Mary and Tad and planned to visit with Robert for a family reunion. Robert was a special aide to General Grant. Uh, City Point is on the James River, just east of, of Petersburg. Well, still on March the 23rd from a rebel clerk's diary, a dispatch from Lee states that General Thomas is at Knoxville and that the enemy has commenced his advance from that direction, is repairing railroads, etc. The same dispatch says General uh, Johnston is removing his wounded to Smithville from Bentonville that the entrenchments of the enemy and greatly superior numbers of Sherman render further offensive operations impracticable. Grant's grand combination is now developed. This is Sherman from the southwest, Grant himself from the south, Thomas from the west, Sheridan with his 15,000 cavalry from the north, some 200,000 men total converging towards this point. To defend it, we shall have 120,000 men without provisions and without some speedy successes, no communications with the regions of supply and transportation. Now is coming the time for the exercise of great generalship. And this is the next day from the same rebel war clerk's diary. The fear of utter famine is now assuming form. Those who have the means are laying up stores for the day of siege. I mean a closer and more rigorous siege when all the communications with, with the country shall cease and this makes the commodity scarcer and the prices higher. March the 24th, traveling on the River Queen, Abraham, Mary, and Ted Lincoln arrived and anchored off City Point. And again, City Point is on the James River, just east of Petersburg. And this was the start of an eventful 18-day vacation for President Lincoln. March the 25th, this is from a journal of hospital life in the Confederate Army of Tennessee, written by Kate Cumming. I feel a very low spirited, I feel very low spirited regarding our cause. A friend, a doctor has just called and has not served to dispel the gloom. He denounced President Davis and said that in putting Negroes into the field, he should have given them not only their own freedom, but that of their families. He added that Davis's last proclamation was the essence of despair and that he and all in Congress know that our cause is gone and that we shall soon be subjugated. I contended against him to the best of my ability and said that even both of our armies were scattered, that if even both of our armies were scattered, we would not give them up, although I could not help feeling there might be some truth in what the doctor said. You know, this is from David Lane, A Soldier's Diary, and uh, again, back to the inauguration. This is 20 to, 22 days after uh, President Lincoln's second inauguration. This is what David Lane wrote. I have just read the President's inaugural. I consider it the most remarkable state paper of modern times, beautiful in its simplicity, grand and majestic in its expressions of lofty faith in the great ruler of nations. It resembles more the production of one of Israel's ancient rulers than the inaugural address of a modern politician. Our camp has settled down to its usual quiet. Nothing remains to remind the casual observer of the strife of yesterday. Our men are, are busily engaged under cover of night in repairing the damage done our works. Part of our regiment went to Hatcher's Run today and returned with the news that the Sixth Corps advanced and now hold one line of rebel works, and that they took about 2,000 prisoners. Poor old misguided 
Robert Lee, every effort to shake off the strangling grip with which Grant, Grant has throttled him but serves to tighten it. This attack and failure proves his weakness beyond a doubt. On this seventh day, this is from a letter that Private Edwin Hall of Brookfield, Vermont, wrote to his father. And uh, uh, Private Hall is, is near Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, the President, Generals Grant, Meade, and Wright were riding around during the day taking observations. They were here to the fort opposite our camp over half an hour, and I had a good chance to see Uncle Abe. And I believe he is the homeliest man I have ever seen for three years, but I guess he is good natured for he was grinning all the time he was here. We all feel as though this to be the climax of this war. They have begun the game and Grant is going to finish it for them. He has got four kings now, and while they have but two, and, and while they have but two, and if he does not make a mismove, he will soon have them all cornered. So, so and I found this quite quite interesting. Can you imagine as a private getting to actually see the see the president of the United States? How, how, and they knew that the war surely had to be coming close to an end. And, and as I have read before, the great respect that they that the, uh, the soldiers and all had for President Lincoln. Well, we're now uh, with President Lincoln on the River Queen, where he met with General Grant, General Sherman, and Admiral David Porter, and they discussed the terms of surrender. And Lincoln feared that heavy-handed peace terms would force the rebel soldiers to take up guerrilla warfare against the federal government. And like I said, let them surrender and reach their homes and they won't take up arms again. Let them all go, officers and all. I want submission and no more bloodshed. We want those people to return their allegiance to the Union and submit it to the laws. When asked about Jefferson Davis, Lincoln said, I cannot officially say so, but I hope that Davis will leave this country. Let him escape unbeknownst to me. Well, a couple days later, March the 29th, General Grant launched his attack on Petersburg. And that night there on the River Queen, uh, Lincoln could hear the cannonade and could see the flashes of the guns upon the clouds. The next day, March the 3rd, 30th, this, the day she dreaded but expected arrived and Verena Davis said her goodbye to her husband Though ailing and feeble, Davis was going to the field. Verita and the children were going to seek refuge in Carolina. Jeff gave Verita a small amount of gold, and on the day before she left, a pistol. He showed her how to load it, aim and fire it. It was a desperate measure that reflected the chaos that was spreading in the hours of defeat there were roving bands of troops, both Yankee and Confederate in the countryside. Should she be attacked, Jeff told Verena, you can, can at least, if reduced to the last extremity, force your assailants to kill you. And that makes me shudder. Uh, Davis even suggesting his wife commit suicide. Uh, Cannot be more horrible than that. Well, next day, March the 34th, 31st, Grant made a big push. Lincoln decided to stay and watch this momentous occasion, and he sent Mary home to Washington the next day, which was April the 1st. And, and on April 1st was when the Yankee and rebel forces clashed southwest of Petersburg. The Battle of Five Forks, which pitted Union Major General Philip Sheridan against Confederate Major General George Pickett, was a costly Union victory that resulted in the death of thousands of soldiers on both sides. The engagement compels Robert E. Lee to abandon Petersburg and begin a retreat that would ultimately lead to the capitulation of the Confederacy. And again, this was a Union victory, but a very, very costly victory. Next day, April the 2nd, Confederate President Jefferson Davis was at church in Richmond when an orderly brought him a dispatch from General Robert E. Lee. 
Lee wrote, I think it is absolutely necessary that we should abandon our position tonight. Lee wrote this from Petersburg. Davis then knew that it was all over. Richmond would soon be taken and he must flee. And Davis got up and left the church. That evening he headed to Danville where his wife had gone several days earlier. The Confederate Congress and the Virginia legislature also fled the city. On that same day of April 2nd, Grant began his final push at 4.30 that morning. Lincoln spent the day in the telegraph office reading Grant's reports and sending them on to Washington. Twelve hours later, Grant reported that Petersburg was surrounded. General Lee's army collapsed with Grant forcing him to escape westward on foot. During the night, Lee pulled his army out of Petersburg and Richmond. Jefferson Davis had evacuated his government. General Porter Alexander, who was one of Lee's closest aides, passionately argued that the Confederate Army should take guerrilla warfare against Union forces, saying they should scatter like rabbits and partridges in the woods, and this, this is the, the Confederate Army should scatter up into the woods. And many of the Confederate soldiers favored that idea, including Jefferson Davis, who preferred any amount of resistance over surrender. They wanted the war to continue at any cost and by any means possible. However, General Lee believed that the country would be full of lawless bands and a state of society would ensue from which it would take the country years to recover. And thank the Lord, General Lee rejected the idea to resort to guerrilla warfare and so officially surrendered at Appomattox. And we do so appreciate General Lee uh, rejecting that idea. Well, April the 3rd, after, after Jefferson Davis and the Confederate Congress had fled Richmond, federal troops marched into Richmond with bands playing and colors flying. The army was immediately set to work to put out the fires that destroyed the business part of Main Street. Confederates left behind 5,000 of their sick and wounded in the hospitals. They also left 500 pieces of artillery thousands of small arms and many locomotives and train cars. And what a horrible thing that the South, they would set fire to their own, to their own cities as they, as they would vacate the cities, even their own capital. On the same day of April 3rd, Lee led his forces west in the hope of joining forces with General Joseph E. Johnston in North Carolina and continuing their fight. But that was not to be before their forces could link up, Lee surrendered a week later on April 9th at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. On April 3rd, Lincoln risked a train ride into Petersburg to visit General Grant just hours after the Confederate Army had vacated. And this, of course, was against the wishes of Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War. And he felt that President Lincoln took too many great chances. Well, the next day, April 4th, Lincoln celebrated his son Tad's 12th birthday by taking him to the Confederate Capitol in Richmond there just 30 hours after the Union soldiers had entered it. No conqueror had entered a captured city with less pomp and circumstance. Lincoln said, thank God I have lived to see this. It seems to me that I have been dreaming a horrid dream for four years and now the nightmare is gone. Lincoln was recognized by a group of black workmen there in Richmond, one of whom exclaimed, Bless the Lord, there is a great Messiah, and he fell to his knees. Lincoln's response, You must kneel to God only and thank him for the liberty you will hereafter enjoy. The group did walk two miles through the city until they reached the Confederate White House. Wearily, Lincoln sat in Davis's office chair, and he didn't quote, he simply asked for a glass of water. He found the floors littered with Confederate currency and evidently picked up a worthless note or two as souvenir and put it in his pocket then. And I've been told that Lincoln did not realize the chair that he sat in was Jefferson Davis's chair there in the Confederate White House. It just, that was just a happenstance. 
Well, on April the 8th, President Lincoln left the comfort of the River Queen, came ashore and with a group, including his wife, visited the depot field hospital. The field hospital with 10,000 beds was the largest of four military hospitals there at City Point. The hospital consisted of 90 stockade pavilions, 50 by 20 in size, 452 tents during the winter, but more tents were added by the time of the president's visit. Those patients with the ability to move about waited in a line outside of each facility and had a chance to shake the president's hand. Bedridden patients each received a personal visit by Lincoln. The soldiers, according to hospital attendant Wilbert Fisk, were pleased beyond measure. But Fisk also pointed out that it appeared that Lincoln took almost as much pleasure in honoring the boys as the boys did in receiving the honor from him. Lincoln's compassion was evident throughout as he did his best to encourage the suffering soldiers, but on at least one occasion was brought to tears at the sight of the ghastly wounds and mutilated bodies. By day's end, the exhausted president had shaken the hands of over 6,000 patients including sick and wounded Confederate soldiers that were there in the hospital. Later that evening, following his visit to the depot field hospital, there would be little time for President Lincoln to rest, even though he had to have been exhausted. A large party was planned aboard the River Queen, featuring high-ranking officers and other prominent guests. The party ended at 10 o'clock, PM and the ship began its journey back to Washington City soon after. The following day, April 9th, was eventful as General Lee surrendered his Army of Northern Virginia to General Grant at Appomattox Courthouse and the Civil War was finally reaching its conclusion. President Lincoln arrived back in Washington City at six o'clock that evening. Upon their return, Mary Lincoln stated concern about enemies in the city to which the president replied, enemies, never again must we repeat that word. And you probably are aware we just six days later that President Lincoln was assassinated. Well, I think I've covered enough for this session and I do thank you for your kind attention.